All right, we're looking at question one, and we're also, let's, let's talk about 13. There's problem set four. So this is something I had drawn up previously. I had a question for the last few steps of 13. In the textbook, the mechanism, the last step is just amide hydrolysis. Yeah, so the, the last step is in fact amide hydrolysis. So do you have any questions on going from the nitrile to the primary amide? Um, you should write out the, the amide hydrolysis. You should draw those arrows. You, you can um, just say PT for proton transfers. And I think the, the book does have the amide hydrolysis it's actually written out. Um, I posted that on Piazza exactly which I think section that is, if that helps out. I'm going to talk about question one. If you want to write out the proton transfers, more power to you. Go for it. Let's take a quick look at question one. Copy. All right, so this is number one. This is asking which of the compounds is the least acidic. Um, so in, in, and right now, we're saying we're trying to choose between B and D. Oh, dear. Let me... I'll have to mute. It doesn't save my uh, settings. There we go. Cool. So in order to look at the something whether something should be acidic or not, a, a good way to do this is to look at this the relative reactivity or stability of the conjugate base. So if we have something like B, which is our pyrrolidine, we would end up with a conjugate base that looks like this, whereas the imid in D. Will look like this. So, are there any different stabilizing factors between these two that people can see? Yeah, so, so D is definitely going to be stabilized through resonance interactions. So not only do we have one oxygen we can put this negative charge on, we can actually put it on either of these oxygens. So since we have all these resin structures, whereas this nitrogen is just going to be kind of stuck holding all that charge uh, to itself, this one will be much more reactive than the imid anion. That means that D will be much more happy to give up a proton relative to B. So we definitely say that D is going to be much more acidic than B. Actually, I think D is the most acidic of all the one, all the options that you have. Yeah, so for any of these, we can go and rationalize. If we take the proton away from the nitrogen, look at the, what sort of stabilizing factors exist. So both E and C have a carbonyl that can stabilize the negative charge. D has two carbonyls that can stabilize the negative charge. B is just kind of on its own. So, so less stable, more acidic, conjugate acid. So th these are conjugate bases. So if something has a very stable conjugate base, the parent molecule will be a good acid. So this is a good acid, and this would be the weakest 
space. This is the worst acid, where this is going to be the strongest base. So this is the most similar to like ammonia as a pKa of like you know 36. So this really does not want to lose a proton at all. Okay, just so I can keep track of some of these requests, I'm just going to go copy some of them and put it into a separate file so I'm not scrolling quite as much. And I'll go back through and answer some comments. So someone suggested S character. So that's kind of intertwined with resonance because this would be a different hybridization. Um, they're kind of interconnected. So when you have resonance, this will also change to SP2 hybridized. This is SP3. So you can also see the more electronegative uh, atom from that perspective too. Cool. Next one up, I believe, is question number four. And you want to go over. So what what do you have a specific question about number four? Okay, so we're explaining why C is less electrophilic than E. Um, so, so you don't have any problems for why um, B and D are certainly going to be good electrophiles. Um, comparing C and E is a little bit more challenging, perhaps. Um, so if we think about how good of an electrophile something is, why would C be less electrophilic than E? Okay, so C and A is almost an easier comparison to make. So if we think about the carbon-oxygen bond, this is going to be more polarized, so it's more electronegative. And then we can build onto that for E. Whereas the nitrogen is less electronegative. So this will have different consequences. Yeah, so, so nitrogen in general is less good at holding onto electrons. If we think about a reaction as an electrophile with A, C, or E, we're going to end up having a nucleophile add in at the carbonyl or at the imine. So what we're trying to consider is how favorable would it be or how stable would a nucleophile attacking this carbonyl versus this imine. Versus something like this ester. So in this case, we actually look at the different energies of these transit uh, of these uh, intermediate tetrahedral of these tetrahedral intermediates. Um, we end up having an O minus versus an N minus. So these are both O minuses, whereas this is an N minus. So this is going to be way much much worse at stabilizing negative charge. If we think about it from a pK argument, similar to as we had up here. Nitrogens are really hard to deprotonate if they don't have additional stabilizing factors. So just like ammonia is much more, um, much more difficult to deprotonate because we're going to an N minus, making an O minus should correspondingly be much easier. So we, in, in sentence, when we're thinking about how electrophilic is something, we kind of want to imagine, or even acidic or basic, we want to imagine a reaction happening to it and compare the stabilities of the potential products. Does that help to clarify this? And it really comes down to the ability of a nitrogen versus an oxygen to stabilize negative charge. Cool. 
that's a really good question for. The next question is, can we use Fisher esterification for 14B? Let's go take a look. Fourteen B Fisher sterification works, so this is implying we're going to do a retrosynthetic disconnection to an alcohol and a carboxylic acid, and this is a good disconnection to make. Um, another option, which will be synthetically a little bit more practical, would be DCC DMAP. This is just a little bit better. Frequently in Fischer esterifications, you want to have an excess of this component to drive the equilibrium forward. So I wouldn't count off on an exam, but if I were doing this in a lab, I'd be using DCC DMAP. This is a more reliable way that you don't have to use strong acid, which sometimes can get you into more problems. So, so the issue with the um, hydroboration oxidation, so this is where we do um, Chlorine, then H2O2, NaOH, and then you'd use PCC. And this would get us to um, this type of intermediate with this ketone. Um, in this case, you both have similar substitution on either side of the carbonyl. So if you treat this with MCPBA, it likely would give you a mixture of two different products, whereas going through a um, approach with a Fischer esterification, it wouldn't have that issue. Um, I I probably, if someone else could maybe go try to look up which slide that is, it'll take me a while to go flip to the slides and get back to you and. I'd rather just keep trying to answer questions. It was probably in one of the first, if I had to guess, I'd say 23. Um, I think it was 23. Um, yeah, so, so more or less these would have potentially kind of similar migratory aptitudes. Um, if you could make an argument that this, this will be better at stabilizing positive charge, so it may favor that. Um, but it's sort of a, you can rationalize it, but if you're just writing an answer on a test, this will definitely give you a surefire way to do it. Um, since people brought up good arguments for rationalizing why this one would be favored, I probably wouldn't count off. How do we do DCC and DMAP there? Um, you mean in this step, how do we do it? Like, how does the reaction work, or? So, so DCC in general will be a dehydration reaction. Oh, no, I was going at, this is a retrosynthesis arrow from the ester. So it would be in a forward direction, it would be going this way. So it's still making esters from alcohols and acids, or you can make amides with amines and carboxylic acids. Potassium permanganate money. I like that. Okay, question number seven. What question do we have about number seven? Let's look at it. Oh, this is one actually, that's, this is good. People were curious about this um, yesterday. Oops. This is a case where we have everything works. Only one thing's gonna be able to work. Which I guess in multiple choice becomes tricky. So I, I would say, are there any responses? Um, are there any responses that 
or, or of the options that you think definitely will work? Do, do you think A will not or you think A will? A will not. So we have someone saying A will not work. Why do you think A will not work? I just talked about uh, B working, that's true. So this is gonna be a yes. Actually, I just talked about C working too, so that could be a yes. D works, because this is gonna go through the acid chloride. And then these are standard you know, alcohol and base substitution, so this is gonna be a yes. Yeah, so the, the, this is esters don't form under base catalyzed reactions. So if we had sodium hydride, in benzoic acid. Essentially, we have a hydride anion. This will quickly deprotonate to give a benzoate anion. So now we're trying to get a neutral alcohol to somehow attack this carbonyl and make a good leaving group, and you simply can't. So this is a really, essentially, you have two nucleophiles trying to come together. Does that clarify why this is this is bad? Not work. Cool. That was a question about number three. Do steric effects or relative basicity of the leaving group matter more for hydrolysis speed? Ah, that's a that's a pretty good question here. Um, so I, I I'm guessing you're this is directed specifically at A versus B. Yeah. So so um, when when you have um, similar types of living groups, so these are both esters. Um, when we think about how hard it is for something to attack. Um, a carbonyl group, like a carbon-oxygen double bond. Um, the, the formation of the tetrahedral intermediate is the slow step. That's why things like amides are much, um, much slower to react because they have lower ground state stabilization. With two esters, we don't really have that comparison. So now we just need to imagine what would be able to make a tetrahedral intermediate faster, attacking something that's not sterically hindered or something that is sterically hindered. So, I guess to answer your question, it will be the less steric, the sterics will matter more here. The collapse of the transition states actually much faster than the addition. So that will be your rate limiting step, and that's how you kind of want to think about um, rationalizing between A and B. Does that answer the question? Awesome. Question two. Could you talk about whether the close inductive effects of answer B make it a better acid than D. I suppose my question is inductive or resonance. So I'll just go back up to this question. Um, generally speaking, resonance will matter more. Oh, wait, compare, wait, let me make sure I have the right two compared. B, so we're looking at B versus D. Ah, yeah. Um, So the, this, so I guess there's a couple ways to think about this. Um, in some ways, B has stronger inductive effects, and it also has stronger resonance effects. So I'd say it kind of has both going for it. So if we consider just the relative starting point of where something like a phenol is, where is what is the pKa of a phenol approximately? Yeah, let's say this is around 10. And then where is something like a carboxylic acid? I'm going to say 5. I'll keep them whole numbers. So already, starting out, D and its you know base form of just a phenol is going to be 5 pKa units higher. It's going to be really hard to get this to drop down very much with just inductive effects. Um, the cases where we saw phenols drop dramatically is when we had like three nitro groups, which were... Um, inductively and resonance withdrawing. For something like a carboxylic acid, we probably want to be comparing B versus A for which one of those two are more acidic. And then you want to bring in a, a 
inductive effect argument there. You could also rationalize this a bit by seeing like, so when we think about um, inductive effects, it's through sigma bonds. So if we're trying to stabilize this oxygen, this has two fluorines that are both one, two, three, four bonds away. Whereas to stabilize this oxygen, these fluorines are only three bonds away. Um, is the methyl on A considered to be electron withdrawing group? Wait, on A or B? This methyl? Oh, wait, would the methyl group on B kind of cancel some electron withdrawing group effects? Um, the, the, the electron donating and withdrawing effects of a methyl are going to be very, very small relative to a fluorine. So we're looking at minor contributions of carbon carbon bonds versus you know, carbon hydrogen bonds, the fluorines will definitely dominate because they are dramatically more electronegative and it's going to be really looking at the electronegativity of a group or an atom. It, it, exactly. So we would say B is going to be more acidic than A because the fluorine is placed closer to where we'll eventually be stabilizing the negative charge of the conjugate base. So again, if we think about how acidic is something, we want to imagine taking this molecule and deprotonating it. And thinking about how well is this stabilized? If this is very stabilized, this is very acidic because the proton can leave very easily. And if we have two fluorines that are closer to the O minus, then it'll be better than two that are a little bit farther away. In this case, we can put this, this negative charge on either of these oxygens, because you also have this oxygen here. That's going to be better than just putting it onto a single oxygen that has some effects from the, the aryl ring. All right. I think we have a new question. We talk about the last reaction for question nine. How does Friel Craft's reaction work here? Is the acyl chloride group activating or deactivating? Let me make a note of that. Let me check to see if there's any other new questions that I can copy over. All right, cool. Let's go to number nine. Let's do this. I'm going to just take this one, copy this all over. No. Sorry. Here's my question. Cool. So we're talking about the, the last reaction. We're asking, is the acid chloride activating or deactivating? All right, so let's, let's, let's go through this. So I'm going to draw out what is the product of reacting an aryl bromide with magnesium? I will copy these. All right, cool. Grignard. We reacted to Grignard with CO2 and then add and then we work that up. What's that going to give us? Benzoic acid. We react benzoic acid with SOCl2. Now we are to where we initially had the question. So um, the question I think was, was asking about 
um, whether this is going to be activated or deactivating. Since this is the site of reaction on this carbon, you want to look at whether the corresponding methoxy benzene ring will be donating or accepting. So is, is this methoxybenzene, how, how will this react? Is this electron rich? Yeah, so, so if it's electron rich, it will be orthopara or meta directing. Yeah, so it's ortho para. We don't have any ortho products listed here. We have a meta and we have a para. So I would be looking for the para product. You only, I only gave you four options because I think these are a little too wide to draw. And the chlorine, it would never pop in. It's, it's, it's not going to do any electrophilic aromatic substitution chemistry. All right, we have a series of new questions. A mechanism for, oh wait, no. Is it possible to use the Gabriel synthesis for 12D? I'll do first. We go over the mechanism for 7C. 7C, can we review 12C? And the last step of something, actually uh, I can probably answer the question about proton transfer. Um, ammonia would be the better base to take a hydrogen away rather than water. Um, you can use either. Frequently in these types of situations, you don't know if that ammonia was protonated by the acid in solution already versus being available to do a deprotonation. So usually the nature of the um, base used to do proton transfers, I'm not very picky on. Yeah, so, so the reactive intermediate in this reaction will be an acylium intermediate, where you have that triple bonded oxygen. And this is going to be very electrophilic. And we have the AlCl4 minus counter ion. All right. Now I can get to 12D. And this was almost like a I, I think this is a very reasonable thing to consider for 12D, is the Gabriel synthesis. And that, I believe, can be found in Lecture 26, or you can look at the reaction overview sheet from uh, my notes last time. The mechanism for 7C. Ooh, mechanism of this. Cool. Let let's let's do it. Um, so this is the. Actually, I may have written most of this out last time. Let me see if I can go pull something up. This is mm, only kind of sorta. This is fairly involved, so I may skip the proton transfer steps. Someone's going back and asking a conceptual question about one. Something is less acidic if it's not stabilized by having extra electron pair from losing a hydrogen. Yeah, so, th so of the, the conjugate base, if you can stabilize the conjugate base, that means it will be more acidic. If you cannot stabilize the conjugate base, that means it will be less acidic. It's all about, if we think about, is this reaction easy? Then that process is probably going to be good. So if, if something can uh, be protonated very easily and the resulting product is very stable, that positive charge has a lot of stability in some way, 
then it'll be a great base. Okay, so we're gonna do just a generic um, reaction of DCC. So this is a carbodiimide. Um, the first thing that'll happen is this nitrogen from the carbodiimide will grab this hydrogen. I'm gonna write this as fast as I can because there are a lot of steps. Um, mainly I'm gonna be trying to get it written down so that we can potentially talk about it afterwards. So now we have an activated aminium electrophile that can recombine with the carboxylate. This gives us a new compound, and this looks actually quite a bit like an anhydride. We see that we have fairly similar looking um, motifs where we have a carbonyl, an oxygen, and now it's an imine. So we're going to view this entire portion here as now a leaving group. So if we had an amine around, it would directly be able to attack the carbonyl and kick this leaving group out. Uh, when you have an alcohol, alcohols are much less reactive than an amine. So actually, this attack is going to be slow. So to speed it up, we add in this magical reagent called DMAP. This is a very nucleophilic pyridine, and this will actually attack this group very fast. It goes through a tetrahedral intermediate. The reason DMAP is very nucleophilic is that it has this very strong dimethyl amino um, donating group, so it can actually go through resonance stabilize that positive charge. And then we can have the DMAP anion leave. After the DMAP anion leaves, we now have an acyl pyridinium that's very, very electrophilic. Yeah, so DMAP will react faster than the alcohol will. And so DMAP is interesting because it is a very good nucleophile, but it also becomes a very good leaving group. So there's some electrostatics where now this is positively charged. Now we can have our alcohol attack. Go to a new tetrahedral intermediate. Two. Oops. Where now we can have the DMAP leave along with pro plus proton transfer to now make our ester and we regenerate DMAP. So DMAP is actually a catalyst. So you just need a little bit of it and it'll keep working over and over again. Yeah, so so it, it serves two purposes. It's a really good leaving group, and it's a really good nucleophile. It's kind of counterintuitive, but um, it accelerates all the reactions with um, between alcohols, al alcohols, acids, and carbodiimides. And you'd also want to be using this with an alcohol if you wanted to make an ester with an anhydride. So the DMAP will attack hydri anhydrides in the same way. To make esters. Does, does that does that clarify this question? Hope so. All right. The next question I've written down is can we review 12C? All right, let's let's talk about 12C. So 
this is one of the the first step. Does anyone so what is what is the first step of this reaction sequence? This is a reaction I think we learned in lecture 26. We have a Grignard and a nitrile. Yeah, so this is the, the first step is making a ketone. Someone asked about this on Piazza today as well. And so first we just do this addition into the imine or the nitrile to make this nitrogen anion. And then on workup, it'll first make an imine, and aqueous acid will further go and turn this into a ketone. So now we need to determine how this ketone reacts with MCPBA. Bayer Villiger it is. And which bond wants to migrate? We want this orange bond to migrate. We want this pink bond to migrate. Orange is a great idea. And that's because it's more substituted, which means it'll better be better at stabilizing the positive charge in the transition state. All right, cool. So we actually have now two different questions on question number eight. Should we assume that one or two equivalents of NH2 or an excess of NH2 is added? Let's go take a look. Oh. So this is a good thing to do. We should we should think about this in a stepwise fashion, and then we will reach enlightenment. So we have a cyclic anhydride. So when you have an amine, like methylamine, and an anhydride, what happens in this reaction? How will these two react? It opens the ring. So yeah, this is the, the overall product. We have an amine, which is a good nucleophile. Yeah, the nitrogen will attack the carbonyl. And we'll get to an intermediate. where now this tetrahedral intermediate will collapse. So unlike esters, anhydrides are much more reactive. These can kick out this carboxylate leaving group. So I'm also gonna include plus proton transfer just to save a bit of time. So you end up with a nitrogen attached to the carbonyl, so we make an amide, but our leaving group is still attached to the molecule. So after the first step, we end up with this acid and amide. So even if you add a whole lot more of this amine, you're just going to deprotonate this hydrogen, and you won't be able to make a second amide afterwards. Now the second question is, we do have an excess of lithium aluminum hydride. So now we just need to figure out how much can this be reduced, and what groups does it go to?
So it takes off the oxygen. <laughs> yeah, so overall we will be losing oxygens. So amides can be reduced with lithium aluminum hydride. Carboxylic acids can be reduced with lithium, lithium aluminum hydride. So at the end of the day, we end up with primary amine and an alcohol. We did an acidic workup, and you see that all of the possibilities with uh, amines are charged. This means we added probably too much acid on the workup, and we ended up protonating the nitrogen. Because there is still acid-base chemistry that can happen. Or maybe you want it to be charged at the end. No. So th there's a question whether an aldehyde can react with SOCl2 to make an acid chloride. And this is a no. Um, and it's kind of for a couple reasons. In order to usually SOCl2, this acts as a, for a lot of times it will, needs to have an oxygen to remove, right? Because we think about the byproduct being um, SO2 gas. So there's not, this, this is a fairly poor nucleophile because we never can get something to actually kick out the hydrogen. You would need to have H minus leave. And this, this really probably wouldn't happen. And, you, and even making the activated species, if we tried to think about making something like this, the aldehyde ends up not being um, nucleophilic enough. A carboxylic acid is actually a bit more nucleophilic than an aldehyde because we do have resonance stabilization of this intermediate. So this won't be able to form. And then if we did have a chloride try to attack this carbon, we still wouldn't have a good weight for the hydride to leave. Can you clarify what it means to include one of each monomer when drawing brackets of a polymer? OK, sure. So maybe I can go back to, let me use a cartoon first and see if this um, might help. Let's say we have a monomer and we have another monomer. So we have blue and red. Hopefully you're not red, blue, colorblind if that's an option. So let's say this is gonna, we're going to do a reaction and we're going to make a polymer where these repeat over and over again. So we just did a reaction. We have monomer, monomer, and polymer. The cartoon equivalent of what, um, what we're trying to do with the brackets is essentially try to figure out what is the basic repeating unit. So in the case of this polymer, it can actually be abbreviated by saying something like these brackets, where we have one red, and one blue within, then we'd have some sort of you know bond connecting the other ones. And so we could have as many of this unit repeated over and over again. We'd always have red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. Um, when we go to use some sort of monomer, now we're we're just figuring out which bonds are the ones that are or which atoms are the ones that are repeating. So we had something like an alcohol, let's say carboxylic acid, we can imagine reacting these over and over again.
and you could literally just keep drawing this you know for the rest of the day making some potential polymer structure and so rather than drawing ultra large molecules and taking a lot of time um, we're trying to figure out what is the minimal repeating unit that would represent the structure that would happen over and over again and so in this case we'd be looking at identifying cases where we end up having each of the two monomers represented again. So if this is our ethylene glycol, we still have that over here. And then our terephthalic acid is this unit here, because these would end up repeating over and over again on a chain. And we're just trying to break the bonds so that we end up having if and you can also imagine maybe another way that's helpful if you imagined the bond here where we put the bracket through it should be able to directly connect to this bond right here and still make the same structure over and over again does this clarify the monomer and polymer nomenclature a bit Even in the literature, people always draw polymers as cartoons with a lot of like dots and squiggly lines. Okay, can we review number 10? I'm gonna write down, we have some more questions. Question 13, there's still some confusion if, we, if we're coming back to it. And there's another question about 10, specific question. I am not sure if a mixture will form or if only one product will form. Question 10, the extra ethyl iodide equivalents would promote single addition, right? No matter what, so wouldn't you get a mixture of different additions? Okay, let's go look at this. So I remember this problem. Actually, I'll, I'll still go back and get it just so that everyone else can see the same thing. So the issue with trying to make um, secondary tertiary amines um, by reacting alkyl halides in amines is that they, they tend to overreact. And so if you're trying to get a single product out, um, it becomes difficult. So if you have this primary amine, it can do an SN2 followed by proton transfer, and it would give you this secondary amine B. And B can react with another molecule of ethyl iodide to give you a tertiary mean. And a tertiary mean can react with an alkyl halide to give what's called a quaternary ammonium salt. So the, the problem with uh, mixtures and reactions is, is more to do with when we have, um, we're trying to, if we've tried to selectively make maybe just this first addition in product with ethyl iodide. This could become a problem if we said, say, one equivalent and one equivalent. These are relative ratios. We still have you know, millions of molecules each. We end up with a statistical problem because as we're trying to react more of the primary amine, we won't be able to stop the secondary amine from reacting. So you'll end up, if you had one equivalent, we'd end up making a little bit of the primary mean, or a little bit of the secondary mean, probably some of the tertiary mean, maybe some of the quaternary ammonium, and you'd probably still have quite a bit of your primary mean starting material back.
But in this case, we have four equivalents. So if each one of these amines can keep on reacting, now we're kind of in a different scenario. We can't go past four. And in order to get, or we, we can't get past four substituents on nitrogen, which means D would be sort of the end of the road. And so now the question is, do we have enough ethyl iodide to actually react all of the starting material to D, or do, is it an insufficient amount? So in this case, in order to react D fully, or in order to react the starting material all the way to D, we would need to have three different equivalents of ethyl groups. We'd have one, two, three. Since we start with four, we have more than enough ethyl iodide. This means that if you let this to keep on reacting, the amines will keep on alkylating until you don't have any more of A, B, or C left. And even once you get to D, you're still going to have one equivalent of ethyl iodide left over after the reaction. So along the way, you will be making A, B, and C during the reaction, but they will all eventually fully react. Does that clarify number 10 a little bit better? So number 13, someone was requesting, and there's a new request for 12A. Okay, is there a... Is there a certain part of... 13 that is um that you want to ask about is it is it about going from the nitrile to this primary amide or would it be more going from the primary amide to the carboxylic acid Oh, okay. So, so I can just clarify this step a little bit further. Okay, so th these are mainly proton transfers. So I'm going to, um, I'll just erase this and take it a little bit slower. I think this can this can help. So after this amide's protonated, the water can attack. We'll end up with. So then we're going to have just proton transfers. So if water is around in solution, it can grab this alcohol or the proton from this alcohol to now make a neutral compound. But we also have a very basic amine around an acidic solution. So it will end up being protonated. And when you protonate this NH2, this now makes it a good leaving group. Oops, got ahead of myself. Because we don't want to be making an N minus at all in this under these reaction conditions. Boom, make a carboxylic acid. So does that help? So after the addition, essentially these are just proton transfers. Yes, never an NH2 minus. NH2 minus is crazy reactive and basic, and we are under acidic conditions for this problem. We want to avoid that like at all costs. NH3, good leaving group. And afterwards, the NHC may immediately get protonated. 
So, so if you were doing this on um, even the problem set, what you could do is do the this addition up here, and you could just go from here to there and say proton transfer. I'm fine with skipping proton transfers so long as all you're doing is moving a hydrogen from one part of the molecule to the other. So since it went from here to here, no issue. All right, so, so to go from the nitrile, I'm just going to do a methyl nitrile. I don't want to draw those extra carbons. So we're under acidic conditions. We're going to protonate the nitrile first. And then this will be able to attack the nitrilium. to give this intermediate. So now, once again, we're just going to do a proton transfer. We're going to move this hydrogen to this nitrogen. So I'm just going to say proton transfer. And then there's actually still one more proton transfer left overall. But I'll draw this a bit more out explicitly. Um, you can see how this is actually a resonance structure. Of this molecule, we can draw an arrow that pushes the electrons back down. And you get out the NH2. You, you don't need to show this uh, resonance structure. But just in case you're wondering why I'm moving these arrows around, sometimes it's easier to see uh, a deprotonation taking place from this structure to get to a primary amide, but they are, they are equivalent. So essentially, the, the extra arrow I drew in this is essentially the resonance arrows. And you can do that all at once. Awesome. All right, I think I had one more question. Review 12A. I actually have another call at 6. Oops. But I will be able to hopefully help you out. OK, so 12A. So this is so this does do a ring opening reaction. So sodium borohydride can react with anhydrides. Let me go back. This this is um, what is kind of drawn out. So maybe I have a little bit too much information on here. Um, so sodium borohydride and anhydrides will reduce it to a primary alcohol and a carboxylic acid. So this half, or you could say this half is a good leaving group. So hydride attacks to tetrahedral intermediate, and we have the leaving group kicked out. Then we make an aldehyde that doesn't live very long around with sodium borohydride, and it goes all the way to an alcohol. So now we essentially took the same idea, and we just kind of connected these two carbons. So our leaving group ends up still being attached to the anhydride or to the final product but it's going to go through the same sequence of uh, reactions. This was actually, don't ignore this. We were talking about other possibilities. Um, you can imagine this just being worked up afterwards in a standard fashion. If you wanted to draw it in the negatively charged form, since I didn't list a workup, no worries.
All right, everybody. It is 6 p.m. And unfortunately, I have yet another meeting today. As video meetings are my life now. Hopefully, I think I got everyone's question. Wait, no, do we need that note? I did the ending part and 13 is different. Um, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look at the book. Um, but I'll try to do that. Or if people put answers consistent with the book, I probably won't be uh, um, counting off, especially given all the other challenges we are facing. Okay, everyone have a good evening. I'll see you tomorrow in class.